Futures TV show, sponsored by CME Group and Trade Station. Hey everybody, welcome to Futures TV show. In this episode, I will be speaking with one of the best point and click traders I know, and a renowned Chicago yoga instructor. Without further ado, welcome to the world of futures. Right, what's going on, my man? How, how you doing? Anthony, how are you? Thank you for having me on. Great to have you here today. So, how many years have you been trading futures? Uh, it's coming up on 20. All electronically? Uh, no, the first year I traded in the Euro dollar options pit, but I wasn't a good pit trader, so. And then from there, what did you end up uh, starting to trade? I started trading ES futures on uh, Globex. Well, look, so you and I have that in common, yeah, right? Yeah, green they and black the screen. screen yeah. Boom, we were trading. Yeah. So you're coming up on your 20 year. I am too, actually. Mine is uh, at the end of this month. How many losing years have you had? Two. You've only had two losing years. Well, I guess it's how do you define a losing year? Negative, Negative. in a year, two. But I've also had years where I didn't really make anything. Yeah. And so if you count those as losing years, then I've had probably four. And the reason I ask that is because you have adapted to so many different types of markets. I know in my 20 year career, I've had more than two losing uh, years. So I know how tough it is and it, and it never gets easier, right? And something that you and I agree with is that we believe that traders need to play to our strengths, right? We don't, we don't think that there's any two traders exactly alike. We both learn right. from a lot of people in the industry, but we always have to be ourselves when it comes to trading our strategy. So how did you build your strategy around your strengths? Well, what I found early on is that I like the bigger play and the bigger picture trades. And I would get caught up trading like small micro moves and I learned to not micromanage myself and allow myself to build ideas that, were, that worked well with what I thought the market was going to do instead of trying to be like, I need to guess what the next five minutes is. Have you had the same type of style and similar strategy uh, throughout your whole journey through this 20 years or has it, has it changed? No, it's been pretty much the same. And every time I've tried to improve and try to do something a little bit different, I keep coming back to what's always worked for me. So talk to us about what your strengths are. So one of my biggest strengths is that I feel like I'm very disciplined when it comes to having an entry point and an exit point and I feel like I'm pretty good at sticking to those. How did you determine that those were your strengths? I mean, I know it sounds easy now after 20 years, it's like you asked me what my strengths are, I could tell you, but at the beginning, right. I didn't know. Right, so I, I didn't really find that out until, I don't know, it was probably my third year of trading and I went and traded with a firm uh, and David Ellis was, was the owner of it and he talked to me about taking responsibility for your trades and taught me how to chart all of my trades and plot all of them at the end of the day and you would go over all your good trades, all your bad trades, and you kind of find, found out what worked for you and what didn't and you learned to separate what you were doing right with what you were doing wrong and kind of improve from there. So journaling? Journaling, essentially journaling, yes. Marking down what you do every day. Do you still journal? Yes. You do. And do you feel that that is a very important aspect of your growth and sustainability? Oh, I think it's essential. Explain to us how you journal. So, I know there's a lot of software out there where you can just have the computer, you know, say this is where you bought it, this is where you sold it, and then you can be like, oh, okay, yeah, I bought the high, that was a terrible trade. But when you, I print out the chart at the end of the day and write down with a pen and circle the spots where I got in and circle where I got out and go through each trade. And when you do that, like actually using a pen and physically doing it, I find helps me really take responsibility for my mistakes and the things I do well. You know, it's so funny you say that because recently on the podcast I chatted with Linda Rashke and she said that by her writing down her preparation, you know, just the closing price, uh, the high and the low, that it triggers a different part of, of her brain to help her remember it. Yeah, I find there's something really therapeutic about writing stuff down, pen to paper. Uh, look at me, I'm writing everything down on uh, uh, trading cards like we did uh, back in the day yeah. and uh, I want to talk about your process and mm -hmm. I want to begin with your preparation. Uh, take us through what your regular preparation is before you begin to trade. Sure, I mean I think that's important for any trader. Um, my process starts usually the night before 
and I prepare by finding out what's coming out the next day. Because as a fellow trader, you know that a lot of times the most valuable times to trade are when it's busy or when there's volatility. So I will check the calendar and see are there any events, any economic releases coming out the next morning and kind of mentally prepare for that or even do some homework on what, what that event means. Say it's an FOMC meeting or, you know, the Powell's talking, you know, I think he has a semi-annual testimony in February and in July. Those are kind of big market moving points. So then in the morning, I, uh, I will go over again what, what the markets did overnight. And that means, you know, the foreign markets, the S&P, where is it at? You know, what are bonds doing? Where's the currencies? And just kind of, nothing big, but just a broad scope of kind of checking in to see where everything's at. And then looking to see maybe there's a particular reason why things are moving and trying to evaluate whether that's a realistic reason for us to be moving or if it's just simply news, you know, because that can kind of help help you prepare for what to expect out of the full day. So I know you like to focus on data points for days that you, you want to make sure you're there and you're trading, but Absolutely. I've always learned that for me when I'm preparing for these data points, I, I end up almost over preparing for them because when I get there, I get to these days, I'm better off just reacting to, to them. So I know you are so good at trading data points. How do you prepare for them? So that's a, that's a fantastic question, Anthony. And this, it all comes down to like expectations. And if you read the, read the news wires or find out what, ex, let's take retail sales, for example, as a, just a data point. So let's say that retail sales is expected to miss by two tenths of a percent. So the expectations are already for it to be negative. Now, that's what the news is gonna say. Well, yeah, it's expected. They're, they're gonna say, oh, it missed to the downside. It's bad, but they might not even be paying attention to what was expected. But that's not really where we're gonna make money. Now, let's say that the retail sales number misses and it comes out at minus 0.6. Well, we all know that's bad for the economy. The S&P market should come off, bonds should rally. Well, the likelihood of you or I actually catching that first move is probably very minuscule because the computers are so far ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, that game days. is done. Yeah. So what I've kind of adapted to is to looking to say, okay, what's the second move after that? Is the initial move like, yeah, it missed, it missed more than what was expected to the downside, but is there some underlying reason? Like, was there a big snowstorm that kept people inside? Is there some kind of, um, any, any kind of outside event that would possibly skew that number that maybe the analysts hadn't really fully taken into account, but then once the markets kind of process it and the real money comes in, the real money isn't the first money in, it's the fast money. Then the real money lets the numbers like, okay, yeah, that's bull. That's, that's not a fair number for to move the market this way, so they'll bring, the, bring it back down. And those are the opportunities I look for when it comes to trading data points. So looking for what the expectations are and looking how those expectations might actually be flawed. And what specific markets are you, are you uh, trading during data points? Well, uh, S&Ps, uh, tenure, and oil. And the reason why I ask that is because are you picking specific markets to trade specific data points? Like for me, yes. I don't even bother trading S&P on unemployment uh, anymore. I try. I go to the tenure. Right. Well, that's a good point. And um, one of the there is a specific point that I like to trade, and it's the uh, crude oil stats on Wednesday. It comes out at 9:30 uh, Central. Right. Well, there's also another data point that comes out on Tuesday after afternoon. I think it's at 4.30, it's the API stats. This sometimes will give the market a heads up to what to expect from the crude oil number. And so let's say the API stats miss, misses and it has a huge build. Well, no matter what the expectations are for the crude oil for what's printed from the analysts, if that comes out with a big build, well, there's a good chance that some of that's already been priced in because they got that from the API the night before. So that might be an instance where I look to, well, I'm gonna fade this number because it's already been priced in to a certain extent and it shouldn't have the extension after we already had one number. So I'm getting the sense that you have a very fundamental backdrop in your strategy. Mm -hmm. But I also know as a day trader, you need to have some technicals. Maybe you don't, oh, but yeah. you know, I know that you do. So talk to us about the, the technical charts, the technical tools that you're using uh, to help you gauge trading these numbers. Right, so that's, that's really important and I think that one thing a lot of people miss is they either, they're all in fundamentally or they're all in technically and 
I just don't, I think you can combine the two and really have a good, a good career with it. Because the technicals just kind of show you what, they're all kind of basically a reversion to the mean or try to help you analyze the price. But with all trading, you have to have confidence and have an idea of like, I think the market's going to do this or I think the market's going to do that. And you have to have a reason why. And the technicals should be, in my opinion, they should be used as, a, as an aid to help you find your entry point and not as a strict reason for why you should do a trade. Just give us a quick rundown because I know we're going to get more into your technical mm -hmm. analysis sure. tools uh, in, in just a moment, but what time frame charts are you consistently looking at and also what technical analysis tools are you consistently looking at? Sure. I, well, I mean, I think that looking at technical analysis tools can go one of two ways. First of all, I start with a two-minute chart, a five-minute chart, and a 60-minute chart. And obviously, you're going to look at a daily chart because I want to see not just maybe what I look at, but what everybody else is looking at. Because, I mean, for any of you who play poker out there, it's just as important to know what your opponent has in his hand as it is to know what you have in your hand. So I try to figure out what the other people are doing. Because the market's obviously at a certain price because enough people think it's going up and enough people think it's going down. You talk a lot about understanding the why yeah. and the why not. Explain right. that to us. So let's say, you know, a good example would be um, the unemployment number that we get on Fridays. And if it has a big miss, I want to understand why will that cause us to rally? And what are the people who are on the buy side thinking? And conversely, what are the people on the sell side thinking, you know, who think that this shouldn't push us up? And I'm always trying to figure out both sides of the story so I know which one that I want to play off of and trying to find flaws in the other side. Do you feel that markets these days, the markets that we're trading, are more fundamentally driven than they were in the past because of all of the news and the social media? Or do you feel that fundamentals are, have less of an impact? Well, I think that it happens some days that it's fundamentally driven. And a lot of times I think it's, it's just floating up you know, and that, that it's not as fundamentally driven as it was, say, you know, about four or five years ago. So in your involvement from when you first started to trade to now, basically what I'm getting from you is that it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. I mean, everybody talks about how the markets are always changing. And, and me listening to you, I think because you keep it so simple, what you're saying is not really much has changed. There's so little different players in the right. game that maybe have create, taken some of those trades away, but ultimately markets consistently move over time based off of these things that you're watching. Right, and I've heard that from a lot of people. It's like, ah, the computers just run the market now. Well, you know what? The computers are made, the computer programs are all made by man. You know, so you just have to figure out what the computer's doing and then trade against that or trade with it, whatever, but you just have to figure out what's, at, what's playing underneath the surface. So you're going to show us a trade that you recently executed on the February 1st unemployment numbers in the E-mini S&P, I believe, right? it would be great. I would love to show you. All right, everybody. Next up, Brent and I are going to talk about a trade that he recently executed on the latest unemployment numbers on February 1st, and we're going to dive deeper into his technical strategy. So stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit learnfuturestoday.com to see what adding futures can do for you. Why trade futures with TradeStation? You can trade over 80 products from home, work, or on the go with a powerful, easy to use interface and prices that let you focus on padding your wallet, not emptying it. Upgrade your trade at tradestation.com. Why trade with TradeStation? It's innovative, easy to use, and totally freaking sweet with powerful tools to track and execute your trades and low per trade commissions on stocks, futures, and options. Upgrade your trade at tradestation.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm joined by Julian Mula, like the money, and Brent Nord. Brent, 
Let's continue that conversation that we had over on the, on the two chairs. Walk us through the setup of that unemployment trade you, you took the other week. No problem, and actually it's a really good example of how to set up for a trade based on what your expectations are, what the market's expectations are, and what to do after. So my preparation for the trade was, well, let's see what everybody's predicting for this number that's coming out on Friday morning. Expectations were for around 175,000 jobs gained. And so we take that into account. And previously on Wednesday was the FOMC meeting, and the Fed decided they were going to put raising rates on hold. So that's a pretty bullish sign for the market, right? An ADP number, which comes out on Wednesday morning, was also fairly bullish as far as it came out and missed to the high side, meaning the economy is doing really well. So a couple of factors I did when I was looking at reports and did some homework was that, well, one, we had the government shutdown. And secondly, it was really cold, really cold here in January, a couple of sub-zero days. So I'm thinking, all right, well, if this thing comes out low, they're going to be able to write that off and, and it, the market will rally on that. And tenure, if they, uh, if they rally on it, that, may, that, that might be something you could sell. So my expectations for this, for this trade going into it is that I'm looking for a number that comes out below what the market expects. And like I said before, that's 175,000 jobs. So my strategy for going into the trade, it says, well, if this comes out and it prints 125 or even 80,000 jobs, there should be a knee-jerk reaction to the S&Ps that they just get sold off. And I'm going to use that as a buying opportunity. All right, well, fast forward to 730, the number comes out and it's 300,000 plus. And at, this, is a, this is a situation where I'm like, I can't do anything with that number because that just means, that just confirms everything what the market had rallied like I don't know, 3% in the previous weeks leading up. And so it's kind of confirmed that whole rally up and, and there's not a trade I can do right after the number. But what I do start thinking about is like, well, what happens if that number does come out big? What does that do to people's expectations for where the market should be? Because it's futures, right? So I believe that that could start changing the narrative of what the Fed's gonna do. They just said two days ago, well, rates are on hike, or rates are on hold. I'm thinking, well, maybe they start to edge some of that out, you know, and take a little more hawkish look at stuff. And this big rally that we had in the S&Ps might be getting a little toppy, because who wants to buy at that? You know, maybe that maybe they wait for a pullback. So my whole day then is like, I'm not doing anything while the market's rallying because a, if I get in, I'm going to have self-doubt about my long position. So I won't any down move. I'm going to instantly puke. You know, my psychology isn't set up for it. So. What I start to do is like, I'm going to wait and see if I can find a bearish setup and the market has switched directions and the trend is changing to down. And that's how I use some of my technicals. I'm like waiting for the story to develop and when they get confirmation, then I start to look for my entry points. That didn't happen until the afternoon. You know, so if you can look at a 60 minute chart, you can see the trajectory of the S&Ps as they rally over almost the entire month of January. I think it was like a record January for how high we went, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm getting all this, I'm painting this picture uh, for the fundamental backdrop. To me, it sounds like you prepare for scenarios and then on the fly, you're willing to adapt and change to what's happening. Absolutely. Right? And then you go to your charts and see if there's any opportunities, like you mentioned the 60 minute, which I'm going to ask Julian if you could pull that up for us right now while I'm still talking to Brent about something that, and it also sounds to me like fundamentals keep you in trades, but technicals get you in. Absolutely, you nailed it. Okay. You know? And the key with this trade is that I have an opinion. I'm bearish. I'm convict, convinced of that. So if you're not convinced of a trade, you're going to get washed out. And the technicals are not a reason to get, get in. They're a reason to help you get in to execute your idea. So when I pull up the five minute chart, you can see I have a couple of exponential moving averages on there. I have a nine period and a 15 period. All right. I use the nine period because it kind of tells me what the crowd's doing because that, that comes pre-populated in my tra trading software and I figure the crowd probably will, is right sometimes. Remember, I'm bearish, so I'm just looking for something to help me to pick a good spot. So I use the 15-minute exponential as my entry point with a stop that's uh, one and a half handles above. That's six ticks in the E-mini. All right. With my exit being 
out of them at the next low, making a new low for the day or from the previous low. And I will get out of half my position there and then one fourth of my position, two handles below that. So it's a continuous trade. Yes. Because that idea from the fundamentals, confirming with the 60 minute chart, is now playing out on the five minute, so you just continue to trade it. I continue, yeah, it's a good trend, trend writing tool for me. You know, I like to stay with my trades most of the day if I can. Something I'm thinking about right now, Julian, if you could please pull up the latest alerts that we're seeing right now in the E-mini S&P. Today we, we had a couple of different alerts for E-mini S&P. One was when E-mini S&P broke 1% down from the close of the previous day. And another alert was when it went under the 200-day moving average. And this is the alert that I want to talk to you more about because it's an interesting price follow-up. We see that E-mini S&P dropped below the 200-day moving average 19 times over the last 12 months. And from what we can see, it looks like it tends to bounce back on the coming days. For example, in the next day, 12 times out of those 19 times, the market went up. And in the next two days, 14 times out of 19 times, the market went up. So it's a pretty bullish indicator that the market will gain in the next few days. You know, I, I like that you showed us this stat because it shows to me at least, and Brent, I'm gonna see what you think about oh, yeah. this, that there's an actual fight there. So there actually is a tug of war. I know everybody talks about the 200 day moving average. It's probably the most talked about thing uh, on, on uh, TV or on, or on any social media, but this actually proves that it matters. So Brent, do right. you look at, you said earlier in our first talk when we were uh, on, the, uh, on the chairs earlier, that you do look at daily charts. Mm -hmm. Do you ever look at maybe stats like this or look at these 200 day moving averages to make sure on an unemployment day, maybe we're breaking out and there's a bigger trend taking place that maybe you don't want to be fading or you want to trade with it more aggressively because this big picture moves happening. Oh, for sure. And I think any trader would say that they use, you know, daily moving averages to find certain levels. I certainly didn't know that these kind of stats existed, but that I find them pretty helpful. Brent, before I let you go today, Define your edge as a trader. It's a good question, Anthony. I, you know, I think if you don't know what your edge is, then you don't have an edge. But I feel mine is building a good story around my trades and having the confidence to see that story through and not being reactionary. That was awesome. Brent, Julian, thank you guys so much. Next up, everybody, we're gonna discuss how you can use yoga and meditation to help reduce anxiety. Stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit learnfuturestoday.com to see what adding futures can do for you. Why trade futures with TradeStation? You can trade over 80 products from home, work, or on the go with a powerful, easy to use interface and prices that let you focus on padding your wallet, not emptying it. Upgrade your trade at tradestation.com. Why trade with TradeStation? It's innovative, easy to use, and totally freaking sweet with powerful tools to track and execute your trades and low per trade commissions on stocks, futures, and options. Upgrade your trade at tradestation.com. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Brent and Lucia Sagan, and we're going to talk about using yoga and meditation to reduce anxiety. Lucia, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. What I want to know first is, do either of you guys have a yoga or meditation practice? You first. I'd say, I'd say it's like yoga for beginners. If you got that yeah. yellow yoga for dummies book, that might be what I would do. I know that book exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good book, and um, there's beginner to very advanced makes no difference. It's good for benefits your health regardless. So good, good right. for you. Yeah. And for me, I started doing meditation probably about five years ago, 
and I meditate regularly, but maybe for only a minute to five minutes on a daily basis. And yoga, I'm still in the yoga for beginners phase, but I, I do like it and I do do it sometimes. Good, yeah, and one to five minutes of meditation is plenty. Um, people have this idea in their head that it has to become this whole lifestyle and that they have to be doing an hour a day, and that's not true. You get the benefit in a few seconds to a minute right away, and the techniques that I'm gonna teach you guys today are really common, super simple, and everyone sees results almost instantaneously. Cool, fire Good. away. Fine. Good, you guys ready to try a pranayama, a breath work first? That sounds complicated. It's Let's not. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. So doctors recommend this one for uh, reducing anxiety. Uh, they oftentimes recommend doing it for 15 minutes a day. I find nobody wants to do that. <laughs> um, it's easier to just do like maybe one minute several times a day or even just once a day or as needed. But I do kind of like doing it before bed, in which case it may, you may extend it up to five, 10, some, you know, maybe 15 minutes. Um, so this is called the yoga two to one breath. And the reason it's called that is because it's going to extend the exhalation twice as long as the inhalation, which will immediately send your nervous system into the calm state, reduce the heart rate, so obviously good for anxiety. Um, what we'll do is I'll guide you and I'll do the counting for you so you don't have to think about it. Um, what you'll do is inhale, exhale through your nose, although there may be a time when that's too complicated and you might need to exhale out the mouth or take a big inhale you know some such way and then just follow along with us again so we'll start at an even inhalation and exhalation for four counts and then i'll extend it one second on the exhalation till we get to the four count inhalation eight count exhalation and then we'll do several cycles of that then you guys can tell me how you feel okay I'm ready, I'm ready. all Good. through the nose right uh through the nose yeah right. but as needed feel free to exhale out the mouth or inhale if if okay. need be. Yeah. Good. So first, let's just take a giant breath in, fill the belly, diaphragm breathing all the way down into the low belly. Big open mouth exhale. <sighs> Lovely. One more. And exhale. Good. So we'll start two to one breath now, inhaling for the count of four and one and two and three and four and exhaling to four as well and one and two and three and four. This time inhaling to four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and we'll exhale to five, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five. Again, inhale to four, and one, and two, and three, and four. Exhale to six, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six. Again, inhale to four, and one, and two, and three, and four. This time exhale to seven, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven. Inhale to four, and one, and two, and three, and four. Exhale all the way to eight, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight. Try to extend the exhalation the whole time. And then inhale to four again, and one, and two, and three, and four. Again, exhale to eight. And one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight. Again, inhale to four, and one, and two, and three, and four. Exhale to eight, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight. Good, big, huge breath in. Big exhale, let it go. You guys feel more relaxed? Yeah. Well, I was grinding <laughs> my teeth two minutes ago, and now I'm not. So, good, <laughs> wonderful. Lucia, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Brent, thanks for coming thanks on the Anthony. show. Everybody, thanks for tuning in today. You can catch all the episodes on futurestvshow.com, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. See you next time.